Hello and welcome back to another episode of Iconicast Podcast. This is our fourth episode. Seems like they always come a little later than I want them to. One of these days I'll just stop explaining. <laughs> but uh, those who followed my, my YouTube channel on Professor Geek, you know that I uh, had, had a summer cold recently. And of course you can't, if you do any kind of broadcasting work, whether podcasting, DJing, certainly radio, or, or even online work like I do, teaching and tutoring, it's... Uh, you need your voice and you need to stop hacking and coughing and sneezing every few minutes because that's that's your tool you know so uh you know when that when that goes out then a lot of things have to take a back seat and, and things have to unfortunately stuff like a podcast has to be pushed back but we are here now and happy to be back good to get back into the swing of things with the iconic cast podcast have a great episode for you this uh this month i'm going to talk about westerns actually i've been in a big western kick lately and uh, i've got a a topic a, a, a germane topic to talk about that that's relevant to the podcast and whatnot and in terms of the ideologies that are out there in hollywood now you know same thing before same thing now and so forth we're going to do our physical media review as we usually do going to turn to some cds talk about some music again this time around and then we'll wrap up things by looking at archetypes once more we are going to actually start with this episode moving into the sub archetypes. So great episode. Stick around and I will be right back. Hey, Simon Grover here. Just wanted to pop in and say hi and to let you know that the music for the Iconicast podcast is composed by yours truly. If you like original electronic music, check out my website at soundengraver.com. I also have content on my YouTube channel, Sound Engraver. I mainly do music and sound experimentation. I work in Logic Pro, Super Collider, but I also talk about art because I like that kind of stuff. So if any of that interests you, stop by my channel or my website, drop a message. I'd love to say hi. And now back to the iconic Professor Geek. So first up, as promised, we're going to talk about Westerns. I've always enjoyed, not always, growing up, you know, when grandparents would have Westerns on on TV, you know, as a child, you think, oh, it's so boring. But when I was in high school and started taking film classes and whatnot and really discovered the power of a good Western, it was just, wow, mind-blowing. And, you know, that was the 90s when you had uh, Tombstone coming out as well and, and a bit of a revival, Tombstone, Unforgiven, you know, those kind of movies were, were hitting the scene and just really great stuff. So I, I had appreciation for Westerns and loved the classic good old John Wayne Western you just can't beat. Rio Bravo is my favorite ever. If I had to pick one, it'd be Rio Bravo, classic Western-wise. Tombstone's pretty darn good, though. But when I started studying archetypes, Westerns rose up in prominence again because we're not going to talk about the Frontiersman archetype today. We're talking about the trickster archetype this month. Frontiersman will be next. There's a reason why you have to study the or have to understand the trickster sub archetype first before you can move into the Frontiersman because they do kind of come in order. The trickster archetype blurs boundaries. We'll talk about that today. And so boundaries are expanded or we don't really know where boundaries are. Think about this literally in terms of a country's boundaries, you know, so think about it in terms of uh, the United States, you know, going from colonial and, and you know, early American times, revolutionary times to expanding westward. Well, that creates a frontier. OK, we've, we've gained or we've purchased or we've stolen or whatever this land in this territory. And now we need to settle it. And there are a lot of dangers in there. It's an unsure territory. And the frontiersman is important because frontiersman goes into that unsure territory and, and makes it safe for people. It's not really a judgment call. The frontiersman's not there arguing we need to keep pushing that boundary. The frontiersman's just there existing in that space. So, you know, at first, in terms of American history, with uh, heroes and, and literary characters and whatnot, you had characters, historic characters, obviously, as well, like Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, but they become mythologized. So the Hawkeye and the Leatherstocking Tales, Last of the Mohicans, and so forth. So that literal frontiersman on the American frontier there. But then as the frontier continued to push west, it was only a matter of time before we reached the Wild West territories. Again, it's unsafe. This, this area is unsafe because it's, and we'll talk about more in detail next episode, but it's unsafe because law and order hasn't quite fully reached and established itself there. And 
in terms of a hero, in terms of the frontiersman hero archetype, you need somebody that'll be there to make things safe. And this usually shows up in Westerns as the sheriff or the town marshal or something like that. We see it beyond even the West in things like space travel or, or technology like cyberpunk and whatnot. So, so the frontiersman's always with us, even if, if our physical boundaries have expanded as far as they can. One thing I talk a lot about on, on my YouTube channel, and I've already established it is a, is a common topic on this podcast as well, is the, the way that a lot of ideologues are trying to infiltrate our popular culture, our art, our films, books, television, and so forth, to try to achieve a change that they want to see in society. And there's a, you, you might think, well, isn't, doesn't any artist do that? Doesn't any artist you know, put their beliefs and their values and their philosophy into their work. Depends on how you mean. Any artist being true to themselves as an artist, whether you're a writer, a filmmaker, whatever, if, if you're doing it correctly, if you're really trying to make good art and being true to yourself, then yeah, your philosophies and whatnot are going to make it into that art. That's just the natural process, but it's an organic process and it should be an organic process. What we're seeing today is people who aren't necessarily what well, a lot of times they're not even writers they're not filmmakers that's not what they're really trained or good at doing but even if you have those who are trained and, and have given us great work in the past their new mode of operand operation now is to treat themselves as propagandists first the first goal for them when they sit down and write a script or shoot a film or whatever is to push an agenda, preach a message. They want this film to accomplish X in society. And that's not the way to make good art. The way to make good art is to sit down and to try to create good art. That should be your first motive. That should be your first, of course, if you're doing that correctly, you know, a lot of your personal beliefs and values and, and things that you would like to see in the world reflected are going to make it into that art. That's always been the case, but it is a big difference in which one of those two goals you put first. And that's the difference between what I would call art and propaganda. And we have in Hollywood today a lot of ideologues. This will come back to Westerns in a second, I promise. But we have in Hollywood today a lot of ideologues. And, and the definition of an ideologue is someone who's been, just the dime store definition here, is someone who's been completely taken over by an idea. This idea is, is their central primary programming now. Everything they do has to be in service of this idea now, of this uh, agenda. People can, um, they can take religions uh, to the extreme point, unhealthy extreme obsessive point where it becomes an ideology. And, and that's not to say that any religion is an ideology because no, of course not. You can believe in, in a certain worldview. You can believe in a supreme creator being with a supreme code of justice and morals that you are to follow. But most religions will also include the concept of free will in there and the concept of, of we are here on earth. We, we can't, you know, we, we need to be concerned with earthly things. We, we, we need to eat, we need to have shelter, we need to, you know, and so forth. So an ideologue though is completely consumed by this agenda of this idea, uh, ideology. They let, it, they let it seep through them. They let it uh, influence every single thing they do. So let's say you've got a great filmmaker, an incredibly talented filmmaker who's been taken over by an ideology. Well, it doesn't matter how amazing they, they were back in the past. It doesn't matter what amazing work they've given us. From the moment that they were taken over by that ideology until, you know, probably forever, because it's very rare people break from ideologies, but it can be done. Uh, from that point on, their work is going to be serving the ideology and not creating good art. So we're seeing that today a lot with the, the wokeism, you know, the woke movements. It's not that a good piece of art can't can't also portray or, or, or get across a message that some might seem deem as super liberal or super woke. But that's not what we're seeing today. We're seeing agendas. And, and it's just not even a matter of, of argument. I mean, we've, we've had, you know, leaked emails from Disney, Sony, other companies where you've got the actual filmmakers, the actual people who work there trying to say, look, yeah, we need, we really need to change the world. We need to start pushing a lot of this stuff into our content and we need to get this and this. We need to make sure kids are growing up with this kind of thing. And 
and again, people try to defend that and say, well, you know, isn't that anybody? Wouldn't you, anybody want good moral lessons to teach their kids? It's all in the difference. It's all in the which comes first. Are you trying to make a good, well quality story that would be good for kids that would teach them things? Or are you trying to preach a message? And and how do we do that? We'll contextualize it in a story, you know. So this is the fall of Hollywood. This is the fall of all of our great franchises, all of the movies and and television series, streaming series and whatnot. This is why Disney Star Wars is is absolutely unwatchable. This is the fall of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And and you can date that back. Again, it's not even a point of discussion. I mean, you can you can see the moment. It was it was with the Captain Marvel movie. There was a hard pivot. Suddenly, Kevin Feige or whoever was ultimately in charge or whatever was no longer interested in in creating engaging stories that drew people in. Then it was about we've got to preach these messages. We've got to present women in a certain way. We've got to make sure we're representing all of these various minorities and, and victimhoods and so forth. And, and, and what's happened to the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Does anybody even really care anymore? You know, and, and that's it was just a hard pivot. It was a distinct place that it turned there. So that's what we're seeing in Hollywood. As I was really picking up on a lot of Westerns, rewatching some Westerns, classic Westerns from back in the day that I hadn't watched in a while, and going back and actually watching some of these Westerns that, you know, are classics that I just, you know, for whatever reason, never got around to. I've been enjoying it a lot. And I eventually ended up watching High Noon. High Noon was a film in the 50s. And I'd heard about it. I really like John Wayne movies, and I really respect John Wayne too. John Wayne is a, is a person, is a human being. I just really have a lot of respect for him. And I had heard back in the day that he didn't like High Noon. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why I never quite got around to watching it. But I wanted to give it a chance. I didn't quite understand all of the the things, that, the, the arguments that had been made about it, because, you know, I wasn't alive during that time. And, you know, I was, I was going in it blindly enough to really kind of give it a good chance. And I watched it, and I'll talk about my thoughts on it in a second. But then I looked into to all of the, the controversy as well. And we won't go, we won't spend a whole time unpacking every little thing here. But long story short, it was during the McCarthy era. It was during the time where, where filmmakers were being blacklisted. You know, there were absolutely... Uh, communist people with communist agendas working in the entertainment industry and McCarthy was was trying to weed them out and we had the congressional hearings and so forth and a lot of the individuals that worked uh, behind the scenes on high noon were communists that's just a known fact now so the idea and, and John Wayne called the movie a uh, communist parable or a parable a a, a a way to comment against the blacklisting and everything that was going on. Now, I just kind of want to lay that out. It, you always have to be careful when you talk about McCarthyism and stuff today because people want to treat it as a binary subject one way or the other. And it's so ridiculous. It's so hard to have conversations with people about it today because, you know, the mainstream media is like, oh, it was terrible. Oh, it was a witch hunt. It was the most horrible, un-American thing that's ever happened. Uh, oh, McCarthy's a crook. He's an evil, this and that. And... And then you got people who don't like the whole communist agenda thing, like myself, but people who want to try to deify or, or, or make McCarthy some sort of saint. You know, I've talked about it before on my channel, and I get comments like, this is your daily reminder that McCarthy did nothing wrong. You know, And uh, you're going to say that about any human being, then there's a problem in your thinking. You're, you're, you're way too given to your own ideology there. Uh, the fact is that there were communists at work in the entertainment industry, and they were at work to try to disillusion the American dream, disillusion the 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 American goals and and, and uh, ideals, because then they could you know maybe hopefully push communism in as a as a replacement. And you know you look at the long game, and we've certainly seen they've made a lot of progress on that front throughout the decades, but. You know, whether you want to sit here and, and, and talk about, oh, so McCarthy was perfectly justified in everything they did and the blacklist and let's get you to name names and, and all this kind of stuff. That, that's a conversation for a different stream. I don't I'm not even schooled enough on exactly what went down and in, in the how to's and everything like that. Uh, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you McCarthy was some sort of saint, but I'm also not going to tell you that, that 
that that the Red Scare or whatever was just a trumped up, you know, ridiculous notion. No, it, it was there. We had communists working in Hollywood and the entertainment industry. And, and again, that's fine. I mean, you've got people of all different philosophies and whatnot working in any industry at a given time. It's America. You're free to hold those philosophies. But when you're trying to use something, especially something as dangerous and dangerously possibly effective as story, as film in particular, and in the American society, especially at the time, when you're trying to use that as a vehicle to deconstruct, let's deconstruct the American ideals. Let's let's do that. Let's tear it all down and, and let's try and put something in place of it. That's what was going on. And that's what John Wayne said about High Noon. Now, you can look up YouTube searches for High Noon, and you'll see people trying to defend it. You'll see some people talking about it, uh, you know, um, accusing it and so forth. I'm going to, again, not to get into the, com- the, to the conversation of was it a parable about communist, you know, was it a, was it a, a, a anti-Red Scare parable? Was it all these kinds of things? I'm not really going to go into that discussion. My problems with high noon is it that it is and this is just you can't argue this and i'll give you the details i'll tell you exactly how it is it is a 100 percent deconstruction of the american monomyth uh absolutely it is a deconstruction of certain american ideals now whether you can argue that that was due to a communist agenda or not or, or whatever that that's a different discussion you can have that you know debate or whatever elsewhere but it's my least favorite western and i don't say that lightly because it is a masterfully made film. It is a beautifully made film aesthetically. The cinematography is amazing. The direction, the acting, the, the way the script is constructed, it's, it takes place in real time. We're waiting for high noon when this um, outlaw is supposed to arrive on the train and his case has been thrown out. He's been uh, released from prison and he's coming back to get revenge on the town marshal that sent him up the creek to begin with. And that's Gary Cooper's character. You've got an amazing cast in this movie. Gary Cooper, Grace Kelly, Lon Chaney Jr. is even in the movie, a wonderful role. You've got uh, a lot of really well-written characters. Uh, Who's uh, Lloyd Bridges, I think, is in the movie as well. So uh, really great artistically done film. So that's why I can't really say, oh, it was just propaganda or it was this or that. But I can tell you that the story that the content of the story is a deconstruction. It's a deconstruction of American ideals. Now, a deconstruction in general isn't a bad thing. Sometimes you can deconstruct something with a story as just simply a way to think about it in a different manner, or let's consider it this way. Or, you know, we've gotten so many people just kind of thinking about it one way. Let's try and turn it on its head a little bit and think about it this way. But it depends on what you're deconstructing to, to really is it moral to deconstruct that or not? So my problems with High Noon are 100% moral, really. I, I think that the American monomyth is a good thing. It, and every story doesn't have to be... And if you are unclear what I mean when I say the American monomyth, scroll back a few episodes. We did a whole episode, and I've talked about it on my YouTube channel a lot as well. What specifically is the American monomyth? You've got the hero's journey, which is you know the hero going through these challenges and and developing through them and so forth, you know, with a mentor or special weapon, crossing a threshold and so forth. The American mono and the hero's journey is also called the monomyth. The American monomyth has some very unique aspects. It is very much like a Christ like story. It's a Christ figure, you know, in terms of literary terms, Uh, someone who's self-sacrificing, someone who is there to serve others, uh, someone who uh, wants the good of the society, wants the good of people around him and so forth. And uh, is very into is it will will deny himself or herself to to you know give that. Why would you deconstruct that? Or, or if you wanted to deconstruct that in a way that maybe presents the a, a different type of character or a different type of, you could do it in different ways. But High Noon seeks to deconstruct the American monomyth, and it replaces it with nothing. Nothing. So I'm going to totally spoil the plot for you here if you haven't seen it. In general, I'm not going to go into super in-depth. But you have this town marshal who served as a marshal for so many years. He's really whipped this western town into shape. It's safe now for people to bring their children out on the streets. It used to be one of these rowdy Wild West towns back in the day. And he's really whipped it into shape. Now he's met a woman that he's going to marry, and she's a Quaker. 
And of course, Quakers don't believe in any kind of violence or anything like that. So he's agreed to quit his job as a marshal. They're getting married and they're going to go off on their honeymoon. And he's going to go be a storekeeper with her somewhere in another town. And the next marshal who's going to replace him arrives the next day. So no big deal. But after they're married, as they're getting into the wagon and they're, they're, they're getting ready to go off on their honeymoon or whatever, they, they receive news that this outlaw who this marshal, Gary Cooper's character had put away is, is his case was dismissed or whatever it was. He's coming back to get his revenge and he's going to arrive on the train at high noon. He's got some of his cronies, I think three, uh, who are there and arrived in town before him and they're waiting at the train station for their, you know, their leader. And, uh, they're going to go and, and they're coming after the marshal. Okay. Great setup, right? Great setup. I mean, you've got unity of place. We're in the town. You've got unity of time. It's, it's at high noon. I mean, some really great storytelling tropes here. And you would think, okay, well, first off, the, this, this marshal says, I can't leave this town. I can't leave. They would just ch chase after me. I've got to stay here, uh, do my duty, because I'm still marshal until the next day when the next guy gets here. And I have to face this man. I have to stay here. That's the beginning of a really great aspirational, heroic monomyth uh, attitude to take, right? Uh, don't shirk your duty. Don't run away. And he goes around and asks for people, tries to form a posse, you know, to, to deputize, you know, a lot of men. His deputy doesn't want to help him because his deputy is huffy that he didn't get called on to replace the marshal. So he tries to deputize some other men. Those that do say they'll join him are either too old or drunks or back out at the last minute when they realize that nobody else is really joining. So it really comes down to it's just this marshal, just this one lone marshal against these four gunmen who are coming, you know, to, to kill him. The town, left and right, it's just like the, as, the, as, the, as we get closer to high noon, the town is, is coming up with, the, they're just these awful examples of humanity, one after the other. People that you thought would be loyal to him or whatever are just, you know, deciding, no, we're too scared. We're going to cover our own butt. They've decided now they're, they, some of them are even angry at him for staying. They're like, look, if you would leave, he would just follow you and he wouldn't stay here. Why are you going to stay here and have him come here and shoot up our town? Why don't you just leave? And, and the marshal himself has doubts at one point and thinks he might want to stay or want to leave rather. Uh, of course, his, his new wife of just, you know, a couple hours is on the verge of leaving him for wanting to stay and take care of this and, and do this and whatnot. But we don't even have a good central philosophy in our main marshal because the quest, the film doesn't answer the question. Well, yeah, by staying, aren't you kind of putting the town at risk? Cause the marshal says at the beginning that if he left, they would just follow him. Well, yeah. Okay. If you want to face the guy, wouldn't you at least leave the town and face the guy so that he wouldn't stay there and shoot up the town? Basic Superman 101, right? Don't get the battle away from the middle of the city where people could be hurt. And, and the movie never answers that. The movie never really gives you a clear reason as to the Marshall's thinking. It, it, and, and it does that on purpose so that maybe, maybe it's a little bit of pride in there. Maybe it's a little bit of, but this is my duty. There's sort of that blind, uh, blind allegiance to it's my duty. I'm the more, I can't leave. I can't leave because it's my duty and I have to do this. Well, yeah, but what if your duty is going to get people in trouble or get people in danger and hurt them, you know? So it's, it's, it's left in question. The film purposefully doesn't answer the question, should he stay or should he go? The film, very careful not to answer that question for you. And you've got all these people in town just showing no spine and no backbone, abandoning him on every front. Uh, we do get a good, a pretty good gunfight when the person, the outlaw arrives and, you know, town marshal holds his own to a certain degree, but it becomes evident that, okay, you know, he takes out one or two of them, but he's going down at this point. And who ends up stepping in and helping him, but his wife, the Quaker woman who doesn't believe in any violence ends up shooting one and killing them. And then, uh, the marshal's able to kill the last guy. Then the town rallies around him like oh this is great this is great and he looks at these people who have just been spineless cowards and have abandoned him in every way and he just looks at them disgusted look on his face and he takes his martial star off and throws it in the dirt and then just gets in the carriage and they drive off how is that a fun story on any level it's a great setup really great setup it's 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 rife with opportunities to give commentary on this or that 
that's a terrible story the way that's executed. And what I mean terrible is in, in the message that it gives. It's a, it's a message of nihilism. It's a message of, hey, once there was this town of these spineless cowards who couldn't be loyal to anybody they believed in, and there was this leader who wasn't maybe even taking their best interests at heart. Maybe he was. We don't really know. Uh, but these villains eventually came for him, so his wife had to throw away everything she believed in, and she ends up murdering, or not murdering, but you know, shooting one of them dead. And then he ables, is able to overcome, and then he just leaves the town in disgust. I'm like, how can anybody watch this movie and just not have a bad taste in your mouth? And I think it's a, I think it's an example of how a lot of people who are trying to defend this movie and think, oh, it's so great, the themes and all this kind of stuff. They're, they're, they're letting the masterful use of storytelling tools to blind them to the fact that the substance of that story is poison. And I don't say that lightly. It's poison. Let's, let's use all of these great, let's masterfully tell this tale so that we can present nihilism before you. Now, I've heard people try to say, no, but see, it makes me think about this and this and that. Okay, well, you did those mental connections in your head. The film didn't. So you can watch that and you can try and say, but the reason why I kind of think of it like this or that, fine, but that's not what the film did. You have to do that work on your own. It's just an objectively bad message to send. It very much is a deconstruction. I'm 100% with John Wayne in that of American ideals of the American monomyth. I utterly loathe this film far more than I would a poorly made film. And you might say, how can you? Because High Noons is very masterfully made. Sure. But the message it's trying to, to get across. You know, there's a genre of Western that comes later called the revisionist genre, revisionist Westerns. I, I hate that title. Uh, and I hate a lot of those movies because they're trying to, you know, deconstruct or revise the idea of the, the more aspirational um, or, you know, just heroic good man, the sheriff or the marshal or whoever it is, you know. Um, and I think a lot of good movies are labeled under revisionist Western, and they're not exactly trying to deconstruct. They're just telling a different story, you know, like um, um, Once Upon a Time in the West, for example. It's not a deconstruction. It's just telling a different kind of story with some different. In fact, it's a story of redemption. It's a beautiful movie. But the uh, this movie was before the revisionist Western was even a genre in the 50s for, and was 100% trying to cut off the American ideals at the knees. It's mind-boggling how people can defend this movie on that premise. You want to talk about how masterfully it's made? Sure. You want to use it as examples of cinematography, you know, and stuff in textbooks? Great. Hey, it was beautifully shot. But just an awful, awful story, awful film. And it made me think of the the wretched deconstructions that we're receiving today. You know, uh, one of the things I really got going with my channel on back in the day was talking about how Man of Steel was a conscious, purposeful uh bad faith <laughs> uh, deconstruction of, of everything great about Superman. Let's, let's take away his aspirational nature. Yeah, but what if this happened? But what if? What, I mean, just trying their best to dirty him up, muddy him up, and make him uh, a character that really can't really inspire you much at all. And, and that, that is done, of course, to, you know, we talked about it when we talked about the aspirational versus cathartic motivational heroes. That's done to try to bring down the level, the standard, so that we can reduce the standard of, of how good we should be in society so we don't have to try as hard. You know, that's the idea. Uh, and that's, you know, that's an old example by now, you know, that's, that's over 10 years old. But we're still seeing those kinds of deconstructions, deconstructions left and right. And the deconstructions are starting to go more and more hand in hand with the woke ideologies that are taking over and supplanting good storytelling. So what do we do? Well, there is a there is a lesson in the in the past that I think we can apply to the future, and it's been applied, you know, in some in some cases. John Wayne hated uh, High Noon, and Howard Hawks, a classic, wonderful movie director who directed Rio Bravo. Um, John, Howard Hawks was an amazing director. He was one of those versatile directors. He directed everything from musicals to westerns to horror, screwball comedies. I mean, he's just really versatile director but he uh he and john wayne came up with this film rio bravo as an answer to high noon as a way to say no that's not how it would go down let's prevent let's present 
a really good American monomyth, a, a good aspirational story. And what do you have in Rio Bravo? You have the town uh, marshal, John Wayne, who has got this villain uh, in custody. He's he shot somebody. He needs to, he's going to be picked up by, or he's a sheriff, I think, and the marshal's coming to pick him up or something like that. I don't remember the details or the names and labels just right. But uh, he's got to hold him in the prison there, in the town prison, the town jail, until the marshals can come pick him up. And the problem, though, is that this crook, this murderer, is the brother of a very wealthy, corrupt, you know, landowner. And the landowners hired all of these thugs and everybody, and they're coming to town to, to spring him, to get him free. And the sheriff could very easily say, I'm not risking my life. Hey, you know, here, here take him, take him, whatever. It's not worth that much or whatever. But no, the sheriff, he has not a lot of people to help him. He has his old deputy, Dean Martin's character, which shows up, who'd been a drunk, who's trying to kind of dry himself out. It was amazing back in the day, but he's got a shaky hand, you know, and we're, we're wondering how much good he's going to be. You've got a, a young a young uh, ranch hand, uh, Ricky Nelson plays, who's really good with a gun, and he's going to help. And you've got Stumpy, the old, like, you know, jailkeeper, <laughs> you know, who's got a limp, you know. Uh, so not, a, not great odds against all of these, you know, uh, bounty hunters and gangs or whatever that, that, uh, the villain is hired to come in there and take it. And it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful, inspiring story about people who are going to stand on their ideals and, uh, and, and really inspire the town around them. The town around them starts to help, you know, and stuff. And just, just a great movie, a wonderful movie. So it's a wonderful example. It's my favorite Western ever for a lot of different reasons, you know, not just that, but also because of Howard Hawks, masterful filmmaking himself, amazing cast, amazing acting direction, beautifully shot and so forth. So I'd recommend going see Rio Bravo if you haven't. It really is like the quintessential classic Western. I mean, I know people would say, oh, yeah, I think this one, this John Ford movie is or something like that. And yeah, I mean, you know, there are a lot of movies we could say they are the quintessential classic Westerns. But I, I think a lot of people would agree with me that Rio Bravo is just, if you're interested at all in classic Westerns, you got to watch Rio Bravo. Really classic film. That happened. And I think we need more of that today. We need more movies today coming in and saying, I'm tired of these deconstructions. I'm tired of, of these ideologies ruining these franchises. Now, we can't go in and just fix the franchise, right? That doesn't work. Anytime people say, well, maybe the next Star Wars movie will be better. Or maybe, you know, if, if, if they could have done another Man of Steel movie, it would have fixed things and you'd have understood what he was going for in the end. No. They can't do another movie in the same continuity because even if that movie suddenly started treats the treats the correct the characters correctly, all it is is a justification and a validation of all the deconstruction that they already did. So it needs to be new movies that come out, and we have had this to some degree. Uh, I need to watch the movie a lot more carefully before I can one hundred percent give it you know uh, my recommendation. But there's a film called Appaloosa, which was in the last decade with. Uh, um, Viggo Mortensen, you know, was in it, uh, forgetting the other name, members of the cast, but this was an, a Western in the last 10 years that tried to undo the revisionist Western. You know, some people call it revisionist Western just cause it's a newer Western, but it's not, it's actually trying to go back to the ideals of the classic Western, you know, real heroism, real, you know, selflessness and whatnot. Uh, see, we need more movies like that. You know, that's an example of a Western, but more, more hero films, more, whatever. That's what we need. And that's what we should strive for. That's what we should try to create. And as I always say, that means stop giving your attention, even in the forms of negative reviews, just stop giving your attention to these horrible deconstructions, these horrible movies. Stop watching the Disney Star Wars. Stop watching the Marvel. Stop watching all these horrible things and give that attention and that energy to either creating good stories or finding good stories that are out there and promoting them, you know. That's what we need to do. And it's a great lesson from history because while high noon, you're always going to have people arguing that it was a great movie, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, in their defense, the, the technical aspects of it are great. Uh, it's a horrible film. It's a horrible message. It's a horrible deconstruction. And it, it spawns something like Rio Bravo to take place which has just become the, the pinnacle of Western filmmaking. I mean, you've got to watch Rio Bravo if you're at all interested in, in Westerns. It makes every list. High Noon does not make every list. Makes a lot of them, like I said, beautiful, uh, masterful filmmaking techniques and whatnot, but it doesn't make every list. Rio Bravo is 100% on every list with good, good freaking reason. Really amazing film. 
So I've already talked way more about that <laughs> than I probably should have. I can go on even more. You know me, I get on these these tracks. But I just wanted to talk about that because I think it's an interesting way to learn a lesson. Uh, we can see what what's happened in the past in Hollywood. We see it cycling through and happening again here today. Not that it ever really stopped, but you know we're just seeing the patterns. And I think we can learn from ways they fought it back then to to fight it today. So. I'll stop there on that topic, and we will be back in a few moments with a physical media review. Hi folks, this is Matt Wilkins from the self-titled YouTube channel, Matt Wilkins. I want to invite you to come listen to the channel. We talk about the Star Wars Expanded Universe, board games. I have two podcasts that go on YouTube and iTunes called Prince of the Universe, where we talk about movies, TV, anything geeky and in the past we want to talk about. And then Saturday morning, Sam and Flange, we give a top five of some random subject every week. So why don't you come on and check it out. That's Matt Wilkins on YouTube. Moving on now to our physical media review. As promised, we're going to look at some CDs today, some music. I've looked at movies, comic books. I don't think I've done a novel yet on the podcast anyway. I've done reviews of all these kinds of media on my YouTube channel. So I'm you know, cycling through and trying to get some variety. I wanted to talk today about this, this series of CDs, series of box sets actually that have come out. You know, I just I believe in physical media so much. That's why I do these reviews. I try and bring you know, physical media of DVDs, Blu-rays, but also films are music to people's attention because this is the way to go. This is the way to reclaim culture. It's one way to fight against their power to determine what you listen to, what you can have access to, uh, if they want to change older recordings and whatnot, you know. So it really is important to have physical media, whichever route you go. If you're a vinyl person, great. I've got no beef with that. I'm not a vinyl person. I tend to like the CD sound and, uh, just easier, so it's my thing. So I first learned of this series. It's called the Many Faces of series. They've done a number of different bands. I have three of three bands versions of these this series. I want to get the Alice Cooper one. I yet to have that one. But Many Faces of series, I, I'll, let me talk you through my introduction to it. I was looking for, I think, a Kiss CD on Mercari or something like that, or eBay or something like that, and I found uh, the CD I wanted, and it was in a bundle, which often happens when people are selling used CDs or DVDs or whatever. They just want to sell a bundle to get rid of all of them. So I looked at the other CDs in the bundle, and they were they were pretty good. Some of them were, yeah, I'll skip that one or whatever, but one of them was called The Many Faces of Van Halen. Now, I love Van Halen, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. So, you know, I got the bundle, I got the Kiss CD I wanted, and I got this Many Faces of van halen and and i got it and i opened it up and saw what it was and it was a fascinating fascinating compilation this is the kind of stuff that man i wish this would have existed back in the day when i was you know a teenager loving cds and loving music because i was you know more people were like that back then you you know you guys know if you're around my age or if you were a teenager in the 90s even the early 2000s you followed bands they were they were like the people who follow sports teams and they can tell you, you know, who's in the band or who's in the, the team and who was traded and, and where this person came from and where they grew up. I mean, that's how we followed bands that we were into because we really did love their music. We love their art. We, we wanted to, you know, we, we knew the different lineups of the band that had happened throughout the history. And, you know, you know, it, it was just wonderful. It was fun to do. It was fun to be a fan of bands like that. And that's how I was certainly. So I would have loved something like this because many faces of Van Halen, is going through and giving you music and recordings, not just from the different stages of Van Halen. You know, Van Halen's had a number of different lineup changes, but it's also giving you peeks into parts of members' careers that you might not have had. So, for example, there's a you know I, I'm a I'm Team Sammy Hagar. You know, uh, Van Hagar is it for me. Now I do love the Van Halen music with David Lee Roth. Nothing against that. It's amazing music, but. In terms of the people, I mean, Roth is just such a walking ego. He's so arrogant. He's just like, I can't even listen to his interviews sometimes. But, and this was great for me to hear because it gave me, I was like, oh, you know, maybe there's more to Roth than I thought of. There's a song that he did for a, I don't remember if it was a cancer. The, the, the text is too small for me to read it right now to double check. But uh, this foundation, like a Make-A-Wish foundation or something like that, but this girl's got this disease. I think it might have been terminal or whatever. And uh, he did a song for her, for this girl, Jessica Abernathy, <laughs> I think is her name, because that's what they sing in the song. And it's, you know, typical David Lee Roth doing his David Lee Roth, you know, uh, game show showman swagger, you know, or whatever, but did this song for this girl. 
and I, and I don't know the details around it. I don't know if the girl's family requested it, if she was a fan of him or whatever, however it happened. But that kind of thing that you would never hear, you know, just listening to Van Halen records. Uh, there are some really cool recordings from Sammy Hagar's time with the band, live, live recordings that you hadn't quite heard. I do wish there would have been more... Uh, more representation from Sammy Hagar's solo career, but I guess our people have already released so many compilations of that because Sammy Hagar was a big deal solo just as much, you know, as his, as his known for Van Halen. So I guess it was just a, not, not really the need to cover that. But there are things like uh, Eddie Van Halen's um, collaborations with other, with other musicians. You know, he would guest on this band or that, you know, musician's album here and there. Uh, there's even one of the really cool finds on this is there's a couple tracks from Gary Sharon's first band ever before extreme the band that he first got famous with or got you know broke into the business with or whatever before they even formed extreme which was really cool to hear you know so stuff like that i just i I'm so fascinated if you love a band and you want to hear the 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 things that different you know people have worked on and whatnot and they're they're a box set it's uh each one is three four cds let me see here three cds you know for the van halen one uh really good solid stuff I have also the um, Motley Crue one, and this is interesting. One of the things they do, they have this on the Van Halen one too, but another thing they have is other artists playing, recording the song, like doing covers of their music or, or um, setting in on a jam session. You know, it just depends on the, the different track that you listen to. But like there are members of Rat, you know, playing on playing some Van Halen songs on that one. Motley Crue has a lot of that as well. It's got stuff, of course, from the John Karabi uh, and Vince Neil eras there. We have uh, a lot of... Mick Mars was the main member who would go out and play on other people's music. So you've got uh, some really cool metal songs from the 2000s and stuff like that from other bands that, that Mick Mars was guesting on. That was good, too. And then uh, finally, I've got the Def Leppard. Many Faces of Def Leppard, which is great. I think to, to really be the focal point of one of these one of these box sets or whatever you need to be a band that's had some lineup changes or it's had quite a history has moved through some different you know um phases in your history and whatnot and of course Def Leppard certainly has you know they they're uh you know ousted the guitarist that they started with you know because of some alcoholism and whatever and then they brought in Phil Collin and then of course you know the tragic uh car accident that lost Rick Allen his arm and then, of course, Steve Clark's tragic death, and you had come in. So you've got a lot of different eras and a lot of different musicians that had careers before or, or after or whatever. And this is a great, uh, a great compilation of those as well. So the Many Faces of series, like I said, I really, you guys, if you know my YouTube channel, you know how huge of an Alice Cooper fan I am. And there's a Many Faces of Alice Cooper, which is of the original Alice Cooper band. I looked up the track listing, and you've got a lot of uh, recordings of the you know, Michael Bruce singing some of the old Alice Cooper songs, you know, uh, once Alice had gone solo and stuff like that, you know, so examples of that kind of stuff. If you're like me, if you geek out about your favorite bands the way you do, uh, you know, comic books or, or whatever, I certainly do. And if you like good old hard rock, you know, uh, classic good rock, 70s, 80s, 90s, just rock, you know, that uh, th th these compilations are right up your alley. You can just search many faces of and you can find out uh, all the bands that they've done. Uh, examples of the and, and they're still currently being made i mean I, I i purchased those used but the def leopard one i purchased just in the last couple months from walmart so the uh you know they're still being made and they're still being done which is great you know it's it's kind of like a a music historian's dream yeah you know so uh i know not everybody that listens to my content is also a big music fan or also likes the same type of music i do but a lot of there tends to be enough crossover for me to still talk about it which is is why i give myself the leeway to do it because you can see the joy in my face i just love geeking out about music and i don't quite get an opportunity to do that as much as i do about superheroes and stuff you know on these platforms so uh tech, check out the many faces of if you're a uh if you're a music fan if you like any of those bands but even if you're you know those bands aren't really your cup of tea Invest in physical media, not just movies. Movies are vitally important. Own your films so you can watch them and watch them in the way that they were released back in the day. But uh, music as well. You know, whatever music you're into, whether you're a vinyl person or a CD person like myself, cassettes are even kind of making a comeback here and there, which is interesting to see. Uh, own the music. Own the music, not just the file on a streaming platform's cloud, you know. Own the music. Own a DVD, a CD, or whatever. It's vitally important. So that's all for the physical media review, and we'll take a break, and I'll be back to talk about some archetypes.
Hello, Al Pals. This is Big Al of Big Al Presents on YouTube. Join me for reviews, rewatches, and rambles about the films and TV of today and yesteryear. If you want to know what I think about the current crop of films and theaters, check out my 10 word reviews. Because sometimes all you really need to know about a film before you see it can be summed up in 10 words or less. And if you love watching films with your buddies, please join me for Films with Friends as me and my friends watch a great old movie and invite you to join us. I'll make sure we do our best to provide you with a link to the film during the live stream as we're watching it so you can tell us what you think about the movie as well. So if you're a fan of films, please join me, Big Al, on Big Al Presents on YouTube. Subscribe and become an official alpha. All right. Well, let's get into our final segment of the podcast now, which is dealing with archetypes. If you somehow stumbled across this podcast here in episode four, you might want to, I mean, you can certainly listen to this segment and, and understand everything we're saying. But with this final segment of the episodes, they each build on each other. And they build each on each other in the way that I teach my classes. If you don't know, I am a college professor. My scholarship is cultural mythology, and I look specifically at modern stories, modern fictions, and seeing how they portray these age-old archetypes, you know, the hero's journey and, and so forth. And I look at our modern, our modern mythologies, which is our shared fictions, you know, superhero worlds, our, our Star Wars, or things like that, sort of shared fictional universes that a lot of society is at least familiar with if doesn't if not if they're not following it necessarily so we started with the uh, talk about the hero's journey in general we made the distinction of the mono, the american monomyth that we talked about earlier in this episode from the hero's journey or the regular monomyth we talked about the two basic types of heroes within the american monomyth you've got the aspirational versus cathartic motivational and you can go back and listen to definitions and all of that in previous episodes and then last episode, we talked about the origin stories of heroes and the different elements and parts of a good origin story, depending on what kind of archetype, depending on if your hero is aspirational or cathartic motivational, what kind of elements and what kind of combinations of those elements, you know, are needed in a good origin story. So that was last episode, if you want to check that out. We've gotten a lot of that groundwork out of the way now. So now we're ready to talk, start talking about some of these sub archetypes, different types of characters are, are heroes that can fall under either the aspirational or cathartic motivational banners. This time around, we're going to talk about the trickster. As I said at the beginning of the episode, that it really is good to start with the trickster, especially in terms of the way I teach these. I teach these in terms of the constructing the American hero. So looking at American, the history of American literature or popular fictions. And, you know, America's really started with, I mean, a lot of the different archetypes, but the, the history of America is a tricksterish aspect because tricksters blur boundaries, you know, so let, let's throw off the, the allegiance to England, you know, let's blur that boundary, you know, let's, let's blur the, the physical boundaries on the map, you know, let's, you know, so there's some trickster work there. And like the uh, previous episodes, I've covered a lot of these topics in depth on my YouTube channel, and I think I've covered them pretty coherently and succinctly, so I don't, I don't see the point in just re-recording that. So I'm going to cut away in a second to present you a short 10 minute or so presentation of the trickster that I had on my YouTube channel for quite a while. That's been pretty popular. Don't go away though after that, because I'll come back with some specific recommendations about the trickster. And uh, just as a, as, a for, as a table of contents here for the video, when we talk about the trickster, there's an important, I mean, the trickster is an important mythological archetype in general. You might have heard about trickster gods, you know, from different tribal mythologies or whatever, Native American or, or African or so forth. Certainly Loki, you know, uh, long before he was a Marvel character, was was the trickster Norse god. You know, so you've got characters like that, Hermes and uh, or Mercury and uh, Greek and Roman mythologies as well. So those are, they're important characters, important archetypes in terms of the sort of a mythical godlike character. And you can have trickster superheroes, trickster versions of American monomyth, 
which are, are American, are even aspirational tricksters. You know, Naruto is a perfect example of a trickster hero. Spider Man's the one I give and talk about a lot in the video. And of course, you can have trickster villains as well, right? The Joker, Harley Quinn, <laughs> the villain called the trickster for the Flash, and so forth. So, you know, there are different shades of tricksterism, and they they can be important or can serve a role depending on whether they're hero or villain, whether they're which type of hero they are and so forth. But trickster in general is a sub archetype. Anytime you see a trickster, they're going to blur boundaries. I'll cut away now and let you watch this video. And then I'll come back with some recommendations of some trickster stories. If you want to get back into that. This first archetype is one that I've spoken about before when I've talked about Spider-Man here and there, but it really is the best one to start with because I find it's the one people are the most familiar with usually. And this is the archetype of the trickster. Now our goal here is to move into the trickster as he manifests in the American superhero figure. And that's where we will end up. But first, a little bit of background information on the trickster archetype in general. Mythologies across the world, across different time periods, commonly contain some sort of trickster figure. Sometimes this is a god one of the gods that they revere. Sometimes it's even a creator god, like in many of the Native American tribes. Sometimes it's an enemy of the gods. More often than not, though, it is a god who can sometimes be a blessing and sometimes be a curse. The one example from mythology that everybody seems to know something about is Loki. Of course, we see this manifested in Loki in the Marvel Universe, but even just the character of Loki from actual Norse mythology. This was a, a god in the Pantheon, in Asgard there with Thor, with Odin, and all of the other gods and goddesses, and he was one that people would pay homage to. But he was recognized as being both a blessing and a curse. In Neil Gaiman's book on Norse mythology, he recounts the tale of how it was really due to Loki that the gods gained their greatest treasures, including Thor's hammer. And he says, that was the thing about Loki. You resented him even when you were the most grateful. And you were grateful even when you hated him the most. And that really is the nature of a trickster. That's why they're so popular. So Loki, Hermes in Greek mythology, certainly, Anansi from African mythology, and Coyote, Raven, its various incarnations in Native American mythology. Culturally, the effect of the trickster in ancient mythologies was to blur boundaries. And this is important on several levels. Of course, just in the story, a trickster blurs the boundaries between right and wrong, between what is wise and what is foolish. You'll often find certain tricksters cross-dressing, blurring the boundaries of gender. They will blur the boundaries of what is natural, what is unnatural, between man and God even. Psychologically, what this does for culture is it helps them expand without losing cultural identity. It helps to think of culture like purebred dogs. If you know anything about purebred dogs, they tend not to be very healthy. They don't have as long of lifespans as a mutt because there's no new genetic information. They're continuously bred with other dogs of their breed and the genetic information becomes so weak at some point. So they will often have joint issues and organ troubles and failures and whatnot. They need new genetic information. And dog breeders experiment with ways to do that sometimes without corrupting the breed too much. And that's what a trickster does for a culture. If you think of a culture like a dog breed, cultures, especially in ancient times when you had different tribes, they can stagnate. Let's say that tribe A is incredibly good at hunting. They've developed all of these skills and all of these tactics, and they've developed tools for sharpening spears just so. And let's say that tribe B a certain ways away, is incredibly good at farming. They have really mastered a certain measure of agriculture very well. Well, if these two tribes continued to be exclusive and self-contained into their tribes, you would have, at the very least, malnutrition happening eventually, right? There'd be too much protein in tribe A and not enough in tribe B, or that sort of thing. This is just a superficial example, but it gets the idea across. Somewhere in between those two cultures, there needs to be an exchange of ideas. The boundary needs to be blurred just a little bit. It can't be done away with, because if those two cultures merge together, then there's no more tribe A and there's no more tribe B. Now you have a new thing, a tribe C. So if tribes, if your culture, if your heritage is to be maintained, 
You can't do away with the boundary, but it has to blur a little bit to let some new information in, to let some new knowledge, to let some new blood sometimes. Sometimes you do have to intermarry and stuff like that. So the trickster god in these mythologies helped people grasp that notion, encouraged people to do such things, to not hold so fast to their traditions, but to not forget their traditions either. That was important for cultural growth. So what about our culture today? Obviously, we're beyond segregated tribes. The American culture in particular is often described as the giant melting pot. And in a lot of ways, that's true. So what can the trickster do for us? Well, the trickster can still do the same thing, but on different levels. The trickster helps us every so often to question certain traditions, to question certain ways of doing things, just to make sure we either are certain about the utility and effectiveness of that and importance, or maybe it was something that worked for a previous generation and we'd like to do things differently now. Tricksters are everywhere in our modern day mythology. Bugs Bunny is a classic that people like to bring up, constantly dressing as a woman to get by on other characters. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? He's really in between. He's not exactly altruistic, but he's not mean-spirited and evil either. Peter Pan is another trickster, blurring the boundary between childhood and adult. Jack Sparrow. Jack Sparrow is a wonderful trickster because he blurs the boundary between what is masculine and what is feminine. He's a male adventure hero who walks around with limp wrists, eyeshadow, and so forth. He blurs the boundary between what is insane and wise and cunning because he acts insane, but oftentimes you see him orchestrating these elaborate schemes of escape. The trickster can also help with people who feel they are the underdogs. In fact, Bugs Bunny's predecessor was Br'er Rabbit. Joel Chandler Harris weaved this character of Br'er Rabbit from the stories he heard from slaves growing up. Harris was the author of the Uncle Remus tales that went on to inspire Disney's Song of the South, the whole zippity doo dah zippity a And these tales were an amalgamation of African tales brought over by many of the slaves and many of the Native American tales of the trickster, sometimes embodied as a rabbit. And if you read a lot of those tales, you have the appeal of Br'er Rabbit, who is an underdog, who is not a powerful being. He is physically at the mercy of Br'er Bear and Br'er Fox. They are the predators of the rabbit, and yet he outsmarts them. He outwits them and is able to achieve his own goals, even under their quote-unquote power. It's not hard to see how stories like that would be encouraging and appealing to people who are literally enslaved. Even after slavery, though, oppression certainly didn't go away to different types of peoples, whether by race, sex, gender, station in life, a whole variety of individual scenarios. That's why tricksters still survive and are still so popular. They have a special appeal to anyone who feels they're disenfranchised to some degree. So how do all of those aspects show forth in the superhero trickster? Spider-Man is perhaps one of the greatest examples of the superhero trickster. This is a boy when he gets his powers. He's a teenage boy, but he calls himself Spider-Man. He's blurring the boundary between what is childish and what is an adult. And that's his story, right? He blurs the boundary between a childlike fun and a childlike sense of wonder and having these powers and yet an adult-like sense of responsibility that he knows he has to live up to. He blurs that boundary. You will often see trickster archetypes named for animals because there's a blurred boundary of what is human and what is animal. So we have Spider-Man, Beast Boy, another classic trickster, literally a shapeshifter. He's going to blur the boundaries of what is human, what is animal. And his personality is very lighthearted, very tricksterish. Robin, Dick Grayson, when he first became Robin, even though he took the name Robin in a lot of tellings from the character of Robin Hood, he's still seen as the bird boy, quote unquote. And his acrobatics make him very Robin-like as he flits to from here to there. He blurs the boundaries of what should be humanly possible. Speedsters are quite often, not always, but quite often tricksters. This is certainly the case with many renditions of Quicksilver, the Wally West Flash, Impulse, and each of them will blur boundaries. They'll blur boundaries, like I said, with Spider-Man between what is childlike and what is adult, what is masculine and what is feminine. Spider-Man does that quite well because of his spider-like powers and agility. He'll often pose in certain ways, which you wouldn't necessarily call masculine. I have this one panel here from the Ultimate 
Spider-Man by Bendis. And this is young Peter Parker developing the web fluid that he's going to use for his web shooters. And here we have this scene of a young Peter Parker, teenage boy, in his basement. They've chosen to depict him in his tidy whities and he's jumping around. If I were to tell you, before you saw this picture, that I was about to show you an image of a teenage boy in his basement, in his underwear, shooting a sticky substance against the wall, you would have anticipated an entirely different image than Spider-Man creating his web fluid. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that any of the creators and artists here or whatever are trying to say that Spider-Man's really masturbating in his basement. Of course not. But whether consciously or unconsciously, they chose this imagery because it represents that in-between space of puberty, of boy to man. And this is a place that the character of Spider-Man embodies so easily. So the trickster is a common subarchetype in the superhero universe, certainly within our culture in general. With any of these topics, I could speak for hours on them as I do in my courses. But for the YouTube videos, we will keep this short. So it's a big topic. It's a big topic that was, you know, as, as, as succinct and as uh, clear as I could be, but also, you know, trying to be somewhat comprehensive in a little 10, 12 minute video there. Hopefully that made sense and you can go back and check it out if you're more interested in it. Books, a lot more books have been written on the trickster archetype than some of the other sub archetypes we're going to follow. Because, like I said, the trickster is one of the more fundamental or foundational archetypes in a lot of mythologies, you know, around the world. But I do have some recommendations. First of all, if the idea of the trickster just is sort of the mythological trickster, you know, the trickster god or so forth interests you, and you want to start there, just kind of start studying it or learning more about that, uh, I'm going to give you story fiction recommendations. So entertainment, you know, you can also just enjoy these stories. Neil Gaiman did a really great book of Norse mythology. It's not a word for word translation of any one text. It's a presentation. It's his own presentation of the actual myths. And he's not like creating and rewriting or infusing his own fictional ideas into it at all either. He's taking Norse mythology stories and he's just, you know, as he's a good pro stylist and he's just writing them out in good story form with his own little, you know, unique style. So it's really great. It's just, it's by Neil Gaiman. It's called Norse mythology. You can find that anywhere. Uh, there's a great audible version of it. You can find it hardcovers as well, hard copies and whatnot. Really recommend that if you just want more. That's one example or one place to go if you just want more of the general trickster. If you want the trickster superhero, as I say in the video, Spider-Man is just a great example of that. There are others. Naruto, if you're an anime fan, You've probably seen Naruto if you're an anime fan, but you can go back and watch some more Naruto. He's a great example of not only a trickster, but a trickster who happens to be aspirational. If you remember our discussion about the delineation between aspirational and cathartic motivational heroes. Really great character, um, whereas Spider-Man's more of a cathartic motivational as a trickster hero. So Naruto's one, but uh, if you're looking at a good Spider-Man... I'm going to give you a movie this time. I give you the book for the last one, so I'll give you a film. Uh, I would look at Andrew Garfield's first Amazing Spider-Man movie. It's not my favorite. I mean, I, I like the Andrew Garfield movies. I think there's a lot of great things in them, but all things considered, I'm a Tobey Maguire guy when it comes to on-screen Spider-Man. But I do think that the Andrew Garfield interpretations show us a little bit more of Spider-Man being the trickster hero, messing with the villains and stuff like that, you know? Uh, you know, the Maguire films give us a certain amount of that, but I think Andrew Garfield films ramp that up and show us that in a really great way. In that first movie, for example, there's the one scene where he's stopping a guy from stealing a car, and it's just so classic. It's just, it's just perfect Spidey straight from the pages of the comic, you know, messing with the villain and stuff like that. So uh, that's an example there. Finally, my last recommendation is is a not a recommendation of a trickster hero but it's a really great film many of you probably haven't heard of this it's one of my it's it's just a wonderful film it's 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 a really great i loved it growing up i still love it today it took place in the 90s i think early 90s it had frank langella you know dracula from back in the day skeletor i mean great actor uh had him in it it had the uh i'm blanking on his name but the kid who was so popular from terminator 2 um He's grown up now, but I, I can't remember his name right off the top of my head. But anyway, the movie's called Brain Scan. And this is not a hero story, but it's an example of the trickster at work in modern day times, contemporary times. You know, so it'd really be a great pairing if you wanted to go read Neil Gaiman's book on Norse mythology and then watch Brain Scan. Because there's the character who calls himself the trickster. And it's a fascinating, 
fascinating. I don't want to ruin anything about the movie for you, but it's a fascinating exploration and in a really cool, unique way of, uh, of a trickster blurring boundaries, ultimately for the good of society, but in a way, you know, like again, a classic trickster isn't necessarily a hero. There's a wonderful line. I'm just going to paraphrase because I can't remember word from word, but there's a wonderful line in Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology where he says, that was the thing about Loki. Uh, you were thankful to him when you hated him the most. And when you were the most thankful to him, you also resented him the most. You know, <laughs> So it's like they, they had this way about them to, to help slash hurt or help through the hurt or hurt through the, you know, anyway. But Brain Scan is a great example of that. A great example. It's a, it's a sci-fi-ish, horror-ish kind of film. Not extreme in any of those instances. I mean, it's perfectly, uh, you know, it's just a great film. I recommend it. You can look up a, uh, a trailer for Brain Scan uh, on YouTube and see what you think. It's really good, well acted, and well done. So those are my recommendations. Uh, the trickster is very important. We're going to, even as we talk about other archetypes in further episodes, future episodes, we're going to come back to relate them to the trickster because a lot of times these archetypes as i mentioned about the frontiersman the frontiersman comes out of or the need for the frontiersman is born out of the boundaries that the trickster blurred you know now we have this unsafe area we need a frontiersman to come in straddle these boundaries and make that a safe place for everybody so we'll keep coming back to it hopefully you enjoyed it that is all for this episode uh thanks for watching thanks for liking and sharing the podcast. I'm still working on getting on some other platforms and trying to build up a following on other platforms, but mostly I'm on YouTube, which is great. I will cut out some segments of this on my YouTube channels to make it a little bit more digestible for people who might not be familiar with the podcast or just be interested in this one topic or that topic. But the more you, you like, share it around and, uh, and help me grow, that's a lot of, uh, it's much appreciated. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of help to me. So thanks for watching. And until next time, Keep enjoying and digging deeper into those true blue hero stories that you love and keep safeguarding mythology.